Hello and welcome to another episode of the ICC Academy Livecast, a new podcast series where we take a deeper dive into global business trends and ideas. I'm your host, Thomas Paris, and in this episode, we will learn about the Incoterms Rules 2020 from within the ICC itself. Our special guest today is Emily O'Connor, Director of Trade and Investment at the International Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for joining us, Emily. How are you doing? Thanks very much, Thomas. I'm fine, and I'm delighted to be here uh, with the Academy to talk about the very important Incoterms 2020 rules. Thanks for joining us. I know we've been trying to get this going for a while. Um, so we're on the eve now of the, uh, of the Incoterms 2020 rules. But before we get started, maybe we can spend a little bit of time explaining a little bit about yourself, how long you've been with the ICC, and a little bit about what it is that you do regarding the Incoterms project. Sure. Great. Uh, I am a lawyer. And I have been at the ICC since 2006, so that's quite a long time. And I am in the Knowledge Solutions Department, which used to be called the Policy Department and is the center of ICC activity around developing positions on issues and developing sets of rules and tools like the Incoterms rules. So when I joined in 2006, after I had practiced law in New York for a while and in Mm -hmm. Washington for a while, uh, I was greeted with uh, the burgeoning revision of Incoterms 2000. So I had the privilege to work on the revision of Incoterms 2000, which led to Incoterms 2010. And that was an extremely interesting process. And uh, I was able this time in leading with a drafting group, the revision that has led to Incoterms 2020 to learn a lot of lessons about the process from last time. So um, that's a, a general overview of where I sit. And I have been working with various parts of the ICC, including the ICC Academy to figure out all the logistical elements that need to be in place once the actual Mm -hmm. rules have been revised. Right. And I think that's really important to have you on this discussion because you've been able to see, uh, I mean, obviously not the entire trajectory of of the rules, but I would say when they have transformed the most. And I think it's going to be interesting to see in your perspective what it is about these latest rules that really makes them important. Right. Yes. And I mean, let me step back and say something generally about the Incoterms rules, which Mm -hmm. many of our listeners will know, but it it never hurts to underline. The Incoterms rules are very, very widely used around the world for selling goods, the contracts for the sale of goods. And we know as consumers that goods are being sold constantly around the world. So the rules Mm -hmm. are very broad And the challenge for ICC with every revision and with our thinking in between revisions is how to keep them relevant. Uh, Because we also know, especially in the last decades, how fast the world of business changes. Right. Um, So if you look back, the rules were launched by ICC in 1936. Now, some people will say, experts in the field will say, well, wait a minute, 1936, it's not that long ago. These rules have been floating around in the ether of traders, maritime traders, you know, whaling ships and such for for hundreds and hundreds of years. And that's true. Um, And the reason that ICC got into the game in 1936 and has been the steward of the rules since then is that people around the world were using these international trading terms, but they have various meanings in various industries in various parts of the world. So ICC decided, hey, we're trying to unify the world. Let's get a set of written definitions of what it really means when you say, for example, FOB. Um, So we've revised them, I think, eight times since 1936 to take account of changes in trade practice. Right. So you said you've revised the rules, and I think that's that's fundamentally important to making sure that they stay relevant, as you mentioned. Uh, what are some of the biggest examples of an incoterm being changed to adapt to market trends, whether it's a recent change or maybe one of the earlier ones? Sure. Um, I'll talk about some earlier ones I, I way before my time being involved in this world. But there used to be, for example, something called FOT, free on truck. There used to be things related to air travel when goods 
first goods were primarily transported by ship, as we know, and then transport changed. Then we could send goods on trains, and then we could send goods on planes. So over the years, the rules have had to be adapted to that. And it's interesting if one is a real student of the process. And <clears throat> I believe in future live casts, you'll be able to hear from other experts who have a more deep historical knowledge of the specifics of these changes. But to see how the drafters tried to get pretty specific with new technologies or new methods of transport, and then mm -hmm. in the next revision would realize, well, wait a minute, things are broadening out. Let's back off from being quite so specific. So it's really, it's, it's a, a great, um, kind of history of transport through the ages if you look at the history of the rules. Right. Uh, that's why the Incoterms rules are always going to be around because there is always going to be a need to standardize on an international level and there's always going to be new technology going forward. And I think we'll touch on that a little bit later, but it's important to, to look back so we can understand how we look forward for 2020. What are the more important changes that set these 2020 rules apart uh, from the latest edition 10 years ago in 2010? Sure, uh, and I'll get specific in a minute, but let me just lay the foundation. And it's, it's sort of a bittersweet foundation in the sense <laughs> that, on the one hand, as we know, the rules are extremely widely used. At the same time, what we know, we have always known and we continue to know, is that they're very often used not quite correctly. And what does that mean? That means the way you use an Incoterms rule is you choose one of the Incoterms rules and you incorporate it into a contract for the sale of goods. So people will frequently choose the wrong Incoterms rule for their transaction. They won't fully know what it means when they put a three-letter Incoterms rule into their contract. They have a general idea often. Mm -hmm. uh, they may have a specific idea but not quite nuanced enough, or sometimes it may be that their company has just always done things that way. You know, every time they buy or sell goods, they use a particular Incoterms rule. Uh, so against that background, we realize increasingly, and in this revision particularly, that we need ICC as the steward of the rules. It's incumbent upon us to try to help people around the world, many of whom are not experts, not lawyers, and not, you know, students of the rules, help them easily make the right choice. So I would say that if there's a legacy for this revision, there are specific changes I will get to in a moment, but the sort of legacy, the, the framing of this revision was to really try to help users avoid mistakes. Mm. And the reason you want to avoid mistakes, it's not just an academic question. Usually the sale contracts, everything's fine in the sale deal, it's fine. When things go wrong and when a buyer or seller realizes, you know, a ship has sunk and all the goods are at the bottom of the ocean uh, and a buyer and seller look at what they have in their contract for the first time really clearly and they realize one party or the other that he or she has to replace the goods or has to buy new goods. Um, and risk has not passed and they're holding risk for the goods, that can be an extremely expensive mistake. So we're trying to help people avoid that. Right. So having said that, um, let me give some examples uh, of how we're doing that. I'm going to stick with this theme for a minute. So, mm -hmm. okay, great. We want to help people use them better. What have you done? Well, we've, we've, those of, First of all, we've made the book, the rules are set out in a book or in an, in an app, in an e-version of a book, but they're written down, they're text that people, we encourage people to actually consult. So the text, the way we've presented the text, we have tried to make more user-friendly. We've expanded the introduction to be more readable, more accessible, to set out some of the concerns more clearly and at greater length and in a more sort of conversational tone. So the introduction is, I think, must read uh, for anyone using the rules, and it will be easier to read this time. We have, um, uh, those who know the rules know that the book historically, or the, the text of the rules historically, have been set out, accord, organized by each of the 13, uh, 11 Inca terms rules, excuse me, there mm -hmm. are 11. And uh, so, for example, if you know you are curious about using 
FCA for your deal. You can open the book and find FCA all in a row going forward. What we've done this time, not only do we keep the presentation where you can read all through a single rule FOB FCA, we have also set out all the article one, two, three, four, five. So for example, if you are saying you're coming with a clean slate in your mind and you say, well, I want a rule where delivery happens and risk passes from seller to buyer at a certain point, how can I find that? People can now go to the second half of the book and read simply the articles that tell you when delivery happens in each of the rules. Hmm. So it's, it's the sort of, it's like a, it's like a matrix. You can look at it horizontally or vertically. And in that way, you can quickly check yourself that you're choosing the right rule. So that's, that will be an extremely useful tool that will make it easy for people to focus on the issues that they really care about. Um, another thing we've done, and of course I don't need to say this to you, is that we have enhanced our training program because we know that people are using Incoterms rules all over the world every day. They don't necessarily have uh, a copy of the text in front of them in a hard copy in the book, uh, nor do they have the op opportunity to go get a training at a live location. And so the Academy wonderfully has developed an excellent, robust training that people around the world can use. So we've tried to make the printed materials clearer. We've tried to make training more available. I don't know if you'd like to say a word about the training at this point. I mean, we can, uh, absolutely. I think you were also very instrumental in this. So, you know, I wanted to thank you for, for reviewing the training and for helping us liaise with the author, uh, Charles uh, de Batista, which, which has been a fantastic experience. But yeah, no, I, I, I myself learned a lot actually about the Incoterms rules while the team and I were building it. Uh, and I think that the focus on making things clear and easier to understand was not only good for you know, our future clients and learners, but also for ourselves. Uh, it made things a lot easier, especially as you mentioned the matrix. Uh, we've actually included an interactive version of the same uh, sort of mapping into the course itself so that... Uh, similar to someone who is reading the book or the printed material, uh, they would be able to sort exactly which incoterms would be right for them based on any of the obligations. So if you're interested in selecting which incoterm would be best, for example, for insurance, you'd be able to go down that column specifically and find out which would actually fit the bill. Uh, and I think that's that's hugely important. So we, we've included that in the course as well as the publication itself because we saw the inherent value right away. And and I think it's fan it was a fantastic initiative by the ICC to, to go down that road. Terrific. Um, and I'm so glad that you as a non-expert found it useful. That's, a, that's exactly the kind of endorsement we need because as I say, <laughs> and one can't emphasize this enough, people of every level of experience and interest in the rules, etc., use them all the time and lots of money hinges on it right. um, when something might go wrong. So it's extremely important. Um, another thing that we've done it, along this set of lines is we've had, people will know in 2010, it was the first time we included any graphics in the book. Mm. The graphics we included were very spare and very simple. We had one illustration for each Incoterms rule showing exactly when delivery happened. Uh, we have, in this version, expanded the use of drawings uh, to explain things, and those appear in explanatory notes ahead of each of the 11 rules. Um, then, going back to the matrix idea where each rule is composed of 10 articles, we have, for the first time, I think, gone into those 10 articles and rearranged the order because we realized that the really critical things that people need to know about, mm -hmm. the sort of starting point of choosing your rule, is when does delivery happen? And the word delivery in the Incoterm sense means... When does risk pass for the goods, damage or loss of the goods, from seller to buyer? And so what we've done is to pull those articles up and move them to uh, delivery, the second article, and risk the third article, so that they're very close to the top. So that if someone says, okay, let me, I think I want to use, you know, X works, 
which of course has its own complications, but uh, X works <laughs> is the first rule. So yes. you would be able very quickly to read articles one and you get to two and you say, oh, wait a minute, right away I see where delivery happens, right away I have to rethink this. Um, so that was another kind of presentational change that we think will have some really serious uh, benefits. Right. Uh, I will touch upon other substantive changes in the rules. Um, I, I say touch just because one doesn't want to go too deeply because for non-experts that some might be less interesting than others. Um, <laughs> there's been a historical question about using the rule FOB, which is a rule that is meant to be used for maritime transport only. Mm -hmm. And we find that it's very, very, very commonly used for non-maritime transport. And the reason it's a problem is that delivery, risk passage from seller to buyer, happens when goods are put on board a vessel, on board a ship. And if you use FOB and there's no ship because there's no maritime transport, the question could arise if there's a problem, did delivery ever really take place? So several iterations of the rules ago, FCA was created. And we love FCA. We're, we're often trying to tell people to go towards FCA rather than FOB, especially for containerized goods. Containerized goods make up a huge proportion of global trade. Right. Um, and one of the issues that arises is that when there is a bank financing involved and a letter of credit that has a requirement for a certain kind of bill of lading, Sometimes people feel that they need to use FOB to get the right bill of lading, and only for that reason, whereas FCA is clearly a more appropriate rule. So in consultation with our experts in the ICC Banking Commission, we came up with some language to add to FCA to try to address this problem. And it's an interesting problem, it's a very technical problem, and for those who know it, they will recognize it. So that was a, that was a, a pretty big change, and we're looking forward to seeing how it plays out, because it should satisfy people and, and steer them away from using a wrong rule. Another thing we've done, one of the things that is listed in the Inco terms rules in each one is who pays for what, and that's obviously a big topic, and there are lots of little pieces of the puzzle and it's very important to know seller or buyer who pays for which pieces. Mm -hmm. We've made those easier to find. We've picked out all the little costs that arise in the various articles in each rule, and we've put them all together in a single place. Um, we've also kept them where they were before, that is to say, in an article on carriage. It will say within that article who pays for it, but we have then repeated it in a costs article. So back to the matrix idea, if you just want to say, okay, let me see what each thing costs in, the, in each rule, you can look down the list of costs. So we've consolidated that. You mentioned insurance a moment ago. Um, yes. There are two Inco terms rules that deal explicitly with insurance, CIF and CIP, the I in each of them standing for the word insurance. Historically, up until now, the level of insurance that was required under both CIF and CIP was the same. Mm -hmm. It was a minimum cover. And after lots of consultation with our colleagues around the world, we decided to change that so that now CIP and CIF have requirements for different levels of insurance cover. Because experience showed us that uh, the trade that typically occurs using each of the two Inco terms rules differs in a way that the level of insurance would call for a different level of cover. Um, we also have made a name change in 2000, Inco terms 2010. Those who know the rules well will know that we rearranged the D, the delivered terms, um, uh, pretty significantly. We consolidated, we created some new terms, we created DAP, delivered at place, and DAT, delivered at terminal. Mm -hmm. We've learned in the past 10 years that delivered at terminal, the word terminal caused unnecessary confusion. And for primarily for that reason, we've changed the name of that so that more closely matches DAP delivered at place, 
D DAT has been changed to DPU, delivered at place unloaded. We wanted to highlight the differences between the term delivered at place and what was formerly delivered at terminal. Essentially, the, the Incoterms rules are the same except for in the previous delivered at terminal, the goods need to be unloaded to be delivered. So now we've changed the Incoterms code, DAT, to DPU, which makes it clear immediately upon reading the name of the rule what's going on. We hope that will help us too. Um, another big issue that has changed over the course of 10 years, sort of, a, again, a bittersweet thing to say, the Incoterms 2010 rules came out after 9-11. And as we all know, uh, since 9-11, security for goods, for people traveling around the world has blossomed as a, a set of requirements. And so we have refined and shifted and sort of enhanced the security related requirements language now that we have had nine years of watching how that's developed uh, over the transport of goods. So that is another area that's been refined. Those are the, the broad areas of change. And mm -hmm. again, if you read the introduction to the rules, which I counsel strongly, these are set out in very clear and useful detail. Okay, you've been on the project for, for quite some time now, for, specifically in the 2020. How long has this revision taken to go from uh, initial concept all the way up until the launch in September? Right, excellent question. Um, the revisions take sort of from soup to nuts pretty much two, two and a half years. Right. And that's not counting the period we are in now, the past few months where uh, foreign translations are being prepared and, and various odds and ends are being tightened up. But the actual substantive revision takes about two, two and a half years. Um, and the way we work is that we get a group, an international drafting group of experts who have mm -hmm. deep familiarity with the rules. What we need on a drafting group, of course, since ICC is an international organization and since the rules are used all over the world, we need deep, experienced experts from different parts of the world. We need experts with different kinds of experience. And I know that some people say, oh, the Incoterms rules are just written by a bunch of lawyers in a room in Paris. <laughs> and that really couldn't be further from the truth. There are a lot of lawyers on the group. The group was eight people. Um, there's a reason for that. The Incoterms rules are legal text. They are language that go into contracts for the sale of goods. But on the drafting group, we had three non-lawyers. Uh, three of the eight were non-lawyers. They were practitioners of different kinds. Um, and so we get our drafting group together. And the reason it takes so long is that we consult over iterative drafts with our network of national committees around the world, and each national committee is going out into its trading community and distilling and gathering the views of its members. And then at the drafting group level, at the secretariat level, we get comments from all the countries, and that's what we work with over the right. years in, in successive meetings to try to come to uh, a reasonable harmonization of the different things we're hearing. You mentioned reasonable. I think that's a, that's an interesting transition because I was I was wondering with such an eclectic and international group, both on the drafting group itself, uh, when it comes to the practitioners and the lawyers, as well as the national committees of ICC, I'm sure that there were a lot of discussions that ended up ruffling some feathers and compromises had to be made to make sure that the rules uh, in every iteration are as representative as possible. Um, so as director of the project, what are some of the main challenges that you faced, uh, or the drafting group rather faced, during the process of creating these rules? Sure. Um, as with any set of rules, I mean, rules by definition are a simplification of the endless specificity of real life, right? So trying to <laughs> sort of rise up a level or two above looking down on all the little tiny things that happen every moment of the day and come up with some overarching principles. So that is what it is to create a set of rules, or in this case, to revise a set of rules. So there's always that notion that you're hearing from certain parts of the world, wait a minute, in our jurisdiction, we have these very, very specific 
needs based on whatever it is, geography or political culture. realities, what, culture, right. exactly, the kinds of goods that are traded, whatever it may be. And one at the drafting group level must always be taking a slight step back and saying, right, if we were writing a set of rules just for this country or this region or this industry, we would be able to get way down and sort of be specific. But we have always that tension between being too specific and being too general. It's, it's actually quite fascinating uh, on a sort of case by case basis. Of course, there are strongly held views on different sides of issues, not just within the, the comments that we received from around the world, but in the room, in the drafting group. I mean, that was always, one must be a diplomat, and thank goodness we all were. You know, sometimes you, you really think you know the right answer, and this is really how it should go. Uh, but you've got to kind of back off and take a broader, uh, a broader picture. And the, another facet to this is what is the role of those preparing a revision and the it's a tension between leading the market and reflecting the market right the experts in the room who are truly very serious experienced experts they may know better you know they may say well mm. we know what people really should be doing but our job is not to lead the market our job is to reflect the market because we want people to pick up the rules and ideally, it is what they find in there will be as close as possible to what they are actually experiencing. It's not like, oh, gee, someday this will be useful because we can see where the future is headed. It's, I can use these right now. This is exactly what I need. So that tension between leading and reflecting was also an interesting challenge. Right. Okay. Uh, so in terms of, of, of leading uh, the market going forward, because uh, I, I know you, you mentioned that, you know, that's not really the role of the rules, but um, a, as the ICC being the voice of business going forward, how do you feel in your own personal opinion about how these rules are going to be preparing the industry rather for the next generation of trade and technology? So we talked a little bit about the, secu the security related uh, requirements, talked a little bit about changing some terms to better match how, how the actual INCO terms, the terms themselves are being used. Um, but in your experience, how do you feel that this 2020 edition is going to be in, or let's say over the next 10 years before the next revision? Sure. And technology obviously comes to mind and everybody says, wait, wait, can you use the Incoterms rules for, for digital, you know, transactions and, and we should have e-Incoterms and all this kind of thing. And when you get right down to it, the rules are, we have made sure at every turn that the rules are technology neutral. They will apply mm. no matter what technology one is using to enact one's transaction. So that we, we are safe there. Um, one thing, and uh, I, I can say a bit about this, there's information also available uh, on the ICC website. Uh, one of the things that the INCO terms rules, ICC is, is contemplating for the future, the next mm -hmm. 10 years of the INCO terms rules, is to develop uh, digital contracts. They're called smart, smart contracts. Smart contracts, right. Exactly. And this is something that, of course, ties into some of the key technological developments of our time, distributed ledger technologies, uh, cryptocurrencies. I mean, they're sort of a, a, a meeting point of many exciting, liberating technologies for people around the world. And the Incoterms rules will be able to play a role in this. And it is envisioned that we will explore ways that that can happen. So that, I think, is probably the most forward-thinking direction that the next 10 years will bring as far as our use of the INCO terms rules here at ICC. Right. For those who are actually interested in how these smart contracts are becoming ever more popular in the industry and how the INCO terms can play a role, we've actually, uh, the ICC Academy has uh, another episode with Dorji Sun, who's the CEO of Perlin, uh, who's our distributed ledger partner with ICC. Uh, so you can look forward to that. That should be on our YouTube channel sometime very soon. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because you know that's going to be uh, one of the projects that is, the, I, the ICC is absolutely going to be looking uh, to develop over the years. And then that, that's a good jump, jumping off place to say just one look ahead, and it, it's not even that far ahead. It, when I first worked on the revision of 2000, 
that led to 2010 and now the mm -hmm. revision this time. Each time we've had people proposing and this time, unsurprisingly, more people proposing an Incoterms rule that can be used specifically for transport of goods to outer space. And I, of course, wow. would urge the drafting group, please, please, can we include this, you know, free on moon or whatever, you know, delivered in <laughs> orbit. And, uh, and I was told by the wiser voices that prevail, uh, not quite there yet, but soon. So my prediction is in Incoterms 2030, there may be an Incoterms rule that will deal with transport to outer space. Oh, uh, I look forward to expanding the, the online course we have now to include some uh, interplanetary travel and, 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 tra <laughs> and tra transport of goods. I think that will be make for some fun videos. Um, so, th so thank you for this. I think I think it's it's very uh, it's been very useful to sort of get a holistic view of how these twenty twenty rules are going to be fitting into the current ecosystem of trade. Um, so, as we begin to wrap up, because it's, uh, you know time time flies when we're having fun. Um, do you have any closing thoughts on your side? Maybe the number one thing that you want people to take away from our conversation. Yes, I do. And it's very preachy. My my days as a <laughs> school teacher when I was very young are coming out. Um, please, everybody, if you're going to use the Inco terms rules, please take the time to read through the rule you're using. Just even though you're an expert, even though you've been doing this for 30 years, and yes, you probably know every word of every rule, but just refresh your recollection. Just sit down and have a read through. Um, and for those that aren't as expert, likewise, we've tried to make them easy to read. It will. It's worth putting in the time uh, ahead of time to avoid a problem down the road. Fantastic. And for those who want to discover what the Incoterms rules are all about, and maybe you're sort of either a student or rather new to the industry, we'd recommend you check out both the ICC website to learn more and also the ICC Academy website to get a demo of the course so that you can get a, a better sense of what to expect in this 2020 edition. Uh, so thank you, Emily. Thank you so much for making the time. This has been, uh, this has been a, a really interesting conversation. Thank you for having me. Great. So looking forward to doing this again. Uh, and in the meantime, I'd like to remind everybody that we are hosting live broadcasts every month. So remember to sign up on our website for free and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of the ICC Livecast. See you next time. <laughs>